Hey everyone, it's Nick with The Whip Shop, and this is my nylon version take on a Joe Strain whip used in the 2005 film, The Legend of Zorro. This is a special order for Alejandro. As you can see here, this whip is in the Zorro style. If we see here in the middle, we have a metal transition ferrule, a silver ferrule here. On the left and the right side, we have two 7x6 two-pass Turk's Head knots. And they have a bit of a cone shape. Instead of just being perfect cylinders, there's a little slant to them, and I really like this look. And today I'm going to show you guys how I built these two knots to have that slanted cone shape, and we're going to be using whip maker's cord to build them. As we look down the whip about four inches into the thong, there is a third small knot tied in whip maker's cord. This is another thing that makes the Joe Strain Zorro whip so iconic. If you've never seen Joe Strain's work, I highly recommend checking it out. He is one of the best whip makers in the world. I've, I've had plenty of chances to try out his whips and his craftsmanship is unbelievable. If you head over to northernwhipco.com, you can uh, order a whip from Joe and you can check out his work there. Highly recommended. In today's video, I'm gonna be using a new material that I don't believe I've ever showed on this channel. We're gonna be using it for not only these two transition knots, but also this heel knot. It's a wonderful material to work with and I found it to be great in balancing the whip and it supports a good solid knot foundation. So with that being said, glad you guys are here. Sit back, relax, and I hope this tutorial is helpful. All right, so I have the whip laid out on the table here, and the first thing that I want to mention is this wonderful ferrule that was sent to me by Alejandro. And his sister is a silversmith, BB. She made this ferrule, and her friend Jack did the engraving. It's wonderful. See the beautiful Z there with some various designs along the sides. And I wanted to give a shout out uh, to BB as well as Jack. So there are their Instagrams on the upper right hand corner. Be sure to check out their work. I was in contact with Alejandro over email and I told him, I said, you know, man, I think there'd be a lot of whip makers out there who would be interested in having custom made ferrules. Would you like me to give your sister a shout out as well as Jack who did the engraving? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. So there's their information. I'm so impressed with this that I intend to purchase some custom ferrules um, from her in the future with some engraving by Jack. So I think that's just fantastic. I believe this one is silver and it's gonna just be a beautiful addition uh, to this whip that is made in the style of the whip used in the film Zorro. So that being said, let's go ahead and move on with this project. Uh, Alejandro, he requested that the handle protrude an inch uh, into the thong of the whip. So you'll see here there's a bit of a swell right after the transition. So we have 16 plat here, uh, he requested these various patterns. Uh, he uh, sent me some pictures for a reference, and I replicated those pictures as best I could. As you can see, it starts with a diamond. We move into this, uh, I believe this is called kind of a wedding band pattern, as, as I understand it, when I worked with Adam Winrich on a video a couple years back. Um, so at the transition, right after the ferrule, I have injected a strand. So we're 16 plat on the handle, and this here is 18 plat. So I have a video in the upper right hand corner if you're interested in how I, uh, I like to call it injecting a strand or adding a strand as some may consider it terminology. Um, there's a video in, in the upper right hand corner where you can uh, see how I do this. Now in that video, I do two strands, making it a 20 plat whip, a 20 plat uh, thong, excuse me, but this whip is going to be an 18 plat thong. And it starts in 18 plat and we drop strands as normal as we work our way through the whip. Now here we have some strips of one millimeter lead. Now there can sometimes be some controversy about the, uh, the safety of handling lead. 
But this is my take on it. If you handle lead, just wash your hands afterwards. Don't go putting this stuff in your mouth. Don't chew on it. Don't lick it. And the end result, all of the lead will be completely covered and will not be exposed in any point on the whip. So while I'm working with the lead, I just uh, I pick it up and I, I work it as, as, I, as I do with anything else. And then when I'm done, I wash my hands off. Some of the hazards that come with uh, working with lead uh, are mostly due to when you're grinding it and you get a powder, a fine powder of lead dust in the air and you breathe that into your lungs. That's what most people are referring to when they express uh, uh, a caution when working with lead. So I'm gonna just work with this stuff. It's fantastic metal. And then I wash my hands when I'm done. That's, that's how I treat this. If you have any additional information on uh, lead safety, I'd like to hear it in the comments. Anyway, we have two strips right here of one millimeter lead. Look at how soft it is. We're gonna be using this lead as our knot foundations on the left and right side of our ferrule. So these two bigger pieces are half an inch wide, as you can see there. And these smaller pieces are a quarter of an inch wide. And the idea is to take these pieces of lead and wrap them around We'll mark them and cut them so that they, uh, the two ends meet like this. Of course, it'll look like this by the time that's done. And then we'll take the smaller pieces and wrap it so the edges are flush right here. We'll wrap that with some artificial sinew. And then we'll put a few little, uh, little trim nails in it so it doesn't slide anywhere. The next thing we'll do after that is we'll take a, a very small hammer and we'll just lightly tap the edges to greatly encourage the cone shape of these two knots. We'll do that in just a second, but I wanna talk a little bit more about the whip in its current state. The average size of one of my whips with two plaited bellies on the handle, uh, once the overlay has been tied on, is about 21 millimeters. Uh, sometimes it can be a tiny bit bigger, a tiny bit smaller. Uh, so I requested uh, from Alejandro that he have his sister make the interior about 21 millimeters. So that's why it slides over this so well. You'll notice that there's just a little bit of, a uh, little bit of play there, a little bit of looseness. So what I've done was I've taken some hockey tape and I've wrapped, first off I took the hockey tape and I held it right up next to the ferrule. And I'll get a little piece out here just to show you exactly what I did. I just took a piece right off the roll without even cutting it. And then I just took a scissors like this and I snipped a little starting point like that. Once I did that, the way that hockey tape is, it's very nice. If we make a, an initial cut, we can just, I made a liar out of me. I didn't have it quite this is for demonstration purposes. But once I had that initial cut that told me how wide it needed to be, you can just pull it back and it maintains that width. So then I cut a piece off and did a, several wraps here, exactly where I want the ferrule to be. So the ferrule slips over easily. Also, I've already dressed the end of the whip, made sure it was nice and flat. I sanded this down, singed the end, melted a little bit with a lighter. So this fits over very nicely. And once we get to our tape, the tape is right where I want this thing to be. I already measured it, measured it. and we'll just, with a little twist, we can put this right into place and we can see right there is some hockey tape. I need to come back just a little bit. And that is where it's going to be. Notice the ends are filled in all the way around so it's not moving anymore. And that is its final resting place. The next step is to take our strips as I've previously mentioned and measure them out like this. And then we'll cut those and put it Put both of them into place. We'll do one first, we'll do one at a time, and I'll show you why we do one at a time. Let's start with the one on the thong. Okay, so I have the ferrule right in the position that I want it to be. And I have here a pair of calipers. So the magic number that we're looking for is three millimeters. So three millimeters will be the space in between the ferrule and the edge of the knot foundation. At this point, I'm gonna take one of my one half inch wide strips of lead, and I'm just gonna fit it around here as we previously spoke about. So I'm stretching it nice and tight, 
And then where the two edges meet, I'm going to mark it with my fingernail like this. I can very visibly see that mark. I'm going to take a pair of scissors that I don't particularly care too much about. As I mentioned, this will dull your scissors if you cut lead quite often. Just like butter. And there we go. There's our first strip. Let's see how we did. The ends meet flush like that. And that's what we're looking for. Next thing I'm going to do is just kind of pick the whip up and turn it and make sure that that space is three millimeters all the way around. And if it's not, it's, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. We have not put our little nails in yet, our anchor nails. So once I feel like that's pretty good, rotating the whip all the way around, that looks nice. What I'm going to do is take some artificial sinew and just kind of get things started. I'm actually just going to cut off a piece like this. I find it a little easier to do instead of holding the spool initially. This is just to tack it into place. I'll just start like this and wrap. And this doesn't have to be extremely tight. It's more so just to hold those ends together like that. And I'll snip that off. You may see that the edge here is not perfectly flush with the edge of the other side. So I just, I can still move it around with my fingers, no problem like that. See, it's still floating quite freely like that. And now this is the point where we do want to start to be a little more precise here and making sure that that space is three millimeters. So see, it's a little bit closer than three millimeters. So I'm just gonna push that a little bit like that, turning the whip and just examining that gap all the way around. There's three right there, very good. Next, I'm going to take one of my shorter pieces, and I should mention that I obviously cut these much longer than I need to. I like to do that just so uh, I have plenty to work with. It's better to cut too much than too little. And I may even be able to use this piece uh, for the other side of the knot foundation. Now, one of the things I want to refrain from doing is wrapping this right where the seam is. So meaning these are the two edges that were joined on the first pass of the half inch piece. I don't want that seam to be overlapping that seam exactly. I wanna offset it. It doesn't matter how much I offset it. And that's just going to help the integrity and the strength of this foundation. So again, I'm just wrapping all the way around, this time on top of our first pass marking that with my fingernail and I can see the mark right there. Again, we're going to cut it with the scissors. And still things might be moving around a little bit and that's okay. We won't worry about that yet. And there we go. The ends seem to be meeting nicely right there. As you can see, that's kind of moving around just a touch there. It's okay. Now here, we want to make sure none of this is going on. We want it to be these edges here. We want them to be flush with one another like that. And this is going to help the overall cone shape of these knots. <laughs> Look at that. The whole thing just moved. That's okay. It's all right. You can see those ends are meeting end to end just like that. Looks good rotate it around. That looks good also. So that looks good. We'll double check that we are indeed three millimeters. We have a three millimeter gap. That one's closed off just a little bit. So I'm going to take the end of my scissors here, stick it in there and just twist it a little bit. And that opens that up for us. Very good. Checking the back. That looks good also. I'm going to take my artificial sinew and I'm going to give this a few semi tight wraps like this. Just to hold that in place initially, we'll cut it now. Again, we're always examining that this is about three millimeters. That's closed off a little bit. We'll open that up again too. And we're about ready to plunge in a few of these trim nails. 
directly through both layers of the lead. That looks nice, they're still flush. And now what we're gonna do is, I have this pair of snippers here. So what I like to do is take these small, these are brass trim nails. You can use pretty much any trim nail that's about this size. This is an exact science here. This is not an exact science. I put the nail in about halfway and we're gonna take it and plunge it straight down through straight down through both layers. And I want this to be right in the middle of my quarter inch piece. So don't have it on the side on the edge, it'll just tear through. Don't have it on the other side, it'll tear through also. Another reason that we don't wanna go on the very edge is because we're going to be taking that little hammer that I talked about, and we're gonna be lightly tapping the edge to mold that lead. You're gonna be amazed at how easily we can take a hammer and just mold the edges of the shape of this lead. Lead is wonderful to work with, it's such a soft metal. So we're gonna take this and plunge it right through the middle of our quarter inch piece like this, which will also go through our half inch piece. So here it is, we're just gonna go straight down. Ideally, I'm gonna go straight down until I feel the steel handle stop me. That's about right there. Once it's in, I'm gonna snip this flush with the lead itself little plunge and a snip. And we'll be dressing this up with the hammer later. So we'll consider this 12 o'clock. Then we're gonna turn it, and then we wanna push one in at the four o'clock mark. Again, make sure things didn't drift around on us, and mo more, more than likely they have. When I push this nail in, things might shift a little bit. So just keep an eye on it. That's all we're, that's all we're worried about. We're just wanting to keep that gap three millimeters all the way around. So it's 12 o'clock, we'll come down here to four o'clock, another nail. This is where this is gonna go in here. Here's my tool. Plunging it straight down like that. And now I can feel the steel handle stopped me, so I'm gonna snip the end of that off like that. And that looks good. We're still at three millimeters. Finally, we're gonna turn it and we're gonna plunge one last nail in at the eight o'clock mark. So they'll be distributed evenly. Three nails will be distributed evenly all the way around this knot foundation here. Again, right in the middle of our quarter inch piece like that. Plunging it in, and I can feel the steel is stopping me, so we're gonna snip that off too, just like that. I think I'm gonna snip that a little bit closer, actually. Protect your eyes when you're snipping uh, very short pieces off of uh, a nail or metal because that piece will fly up and get in your eye. I've done that a few times. So there we go, let's double check our spacing. Three millimeters, three millimeters, all the way around, that looks great. The next step is to take some more artificial sinew, and because we know where our ferrule is going to be, and we also have this tacked into place so it's not going anywhere, I'm gonna take this ferrule and slide it down. And this is the luxury of uh, doing this knot first. Actually, when we tie the knot, we can move this ferrule out of the way. Once the knot is tied, we can push this ferrule and butt it right up against the bites of the knot. We won't have this luxury when we work on our secondary knot because this ferrule will already be in the place. This is a nice little thing that we are able to do because it is the first heel knot foundation and knot uh, on this whip. So I'm gonna take some artificial sinew and I'm just gonna give this some pretty hefty wraps here like this. A couple of wraps over the quarter inch piece. And then I'm going to really focus on filling in this gap in between the first pass, the half inch piece and the quarter inch piece. And you'll see this come together. We want it to be a ramp instead of a step. And this is something that we're able to achieve with this artificial sinew that acts as a putty. 
like that. And that looks good. I'm gonna cut that. I'm gonna grab my hammer now. So we have here a very small hammer. Don't exactly know what this hammer is used for, but it has about a half inch head here. And this is just kind of nice in shaping our lead knot foundations. I'm gonna start off by taking this hammer and I'm going to put something soft underneath the work area. And the reason I'm doing this is because where I'm striking, I want that part to flatten out. But underneath, I don't want this to smush against the hard workbench. So this little, uh, little hat here will keep it from deforming. I only want the striking area to be what's changing the shape. So we're going to start off with the smaller edge here. All the way around like that. Just lightly tapping the lip. And I'll give you guys some close-ups here in a second to show you what I'm doing. So I want this edge here to be just kind of smashed down a little bit. And again, I want this to be more of a ramp than a step. I'm just rounding off that lip there. And we'll be doing the same thing to this side as well. It's very satisfying to shape a metal with a hammer. This is essentially what a blacksmith does um, when he or she heats up metal. The metal becomes so much softer and you're able to shape it. And it's a really satisfying experience to do that. Lead is so soft that you don't need to heat it up. That's looking nice. Next, I'm just going to take this hammer and do an overall reduction to the whole thing. And when I'm striking, I'm not going straight down like this. I'm angling that to encourage that cone shape. And you can see the cone shape is looking nice. Next, I'm just kind of flattening this a little bit before I start shaping the edge. There are some little bulges that are sticking out higher in some places than in others, and that's just because I shaped off this front edge of the foundation. And I'm going to move this so I don't accidentally hit it. That looks good. Next thing I'm gonna do is turn the whip like this. Now we're going to begin working on this lip here. This is gonna be the lip that uh, is going to be touching our ferrule. So I don't wanna to be too aggressive on this lip here. I just want to round it off overall. I can just hold this in my hand, I think. That'll be just fine. I'm just almost letting the weight of the hammer do the work because this lead is so incredibly soft. It just takes a little tap to round that end off. And I'm gonna work on this slant just a little bit more here. You can feel the nail as I'm hitting it right there. Hear that sound, how it changes? That's the nail that we plunged in. So it might be a good idea to hit that a couple times so that the top of that where we cut it off is also flush with the uh, lead. At this point, I have cut a five foot section of whip maker's cord. I'm gonna be tying these knots in black to match the rest of the whip. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna do here is thread it in to one of my type one lacing needles from jig pro shops there's a link in the description to get one of these needles also a great little place to store your needles is it uh, an old cigar tube this is an aluminum cigar tube with a threaded top and it holds the needles very nicely I'll put this little loop on here so i can see it better when it's in my bag so i'm going to take one end i already melted i cut at an angle 
and melted this end. I'm going to thread this in my needle. Again, because everything is where it, we need it to be or where we know it's going to be, I'm going to take this ferrule and simply take it off. We don't need that ferrule on when we tie this knot. Now I'm going to tie a two pass seven by six Turk's head knot right now. I already have tutorials on this knot, so I'm not going to go uh, extremely slowly around the back there. Go over. I'm going to tie this very loosely on the initial passes. That's the key, is to tie it very loosely. We can snug things up as we go. And we're going to go over that one, under this one. We're going to go over that one there, holding it with my finger. Now I'm going to go under this one, like this. Make sure there's no twists. We're going to go over this one, over that one too, and under this one. We're going to go over this last one here. You see a twist there? We'll take care of that momentarily. So we went under this one. We're going to go over this one like that. Over that one. We're going to go over this one and under this one. And we'll go over this one, under this one. Over this one and under this one. And as it currently stands, this is a 5x4 single pass Turk said knot. And like I said, at this point, we'll just go ahead and make sure there's no twists. And yes, there is one right there. We're just going to take that twist and work it through. So twist it back to where it needs to be, all the way around. That. There we go. Getting the twist out of it, like that. Keep on twisting it back to the way it should be, like that. Another twist there. Well, the same twist, we're just working it through. And there we go. The twist is gone, except the twist is here now. <laughs> okay, take that out. And this is a nice little place where we can stop currently at 5x4. Actually, let's go ahead and finish this off. We'll start right there. Now it's a true single pass 5x4 Turk's head knot. I'm just going to go around, turn the whip. Man, I'm popular today. Turn that phone off. And just push things around and just get all of these little openings, these squares, or I should say diamonds, we want them to be about even. So we don't want one to be larger than the other. And there's still plenty of time to work with here. I got to turn the phone off. Sorry about this. So see that? I'm just pushing things around so it's all roughly even. We still have plenty of time to get things even. So look at this, just finger tight, not even. It's actually tied very loosely. As I mentioned in previous, previous videos, if I tie this super tight from the first pass, things are gonna get so bunched up and it's gonna be way too tight by the time we're done. So really kind of discipline yourself in tying these knots extremely loosely, especially before you expand it to a seven by six, which we're gonna do right now. This is a five by four single pass Turk said knot. We're now going to expand it to a single pass seven by six. We're going to do so by following everything this strand does. 
So what it does, we're going to do on the right. So I went under, we're going to go under. We already did. Now it goes over, then it goes under like this. And a nice little way to temporarily make sure there are no twists is to grab it like this at the base and just take your fingernail like that and pull it all the way to the needle. And if you keep it oriented like this without turning it, you'll be able to get quite a few passes without it getting tangled, twisted. Under that one, we're going to go over this X. So we're going to go over that one and over that one, over this X here. And then we're going to follow this strand to the left. Remember, up to the right, down to the left. Over this X right here. We're going to pick this strand up here. Where it goes under, we're going to go under, except on the left side now since we're descending. Don't pull this so tight. Just have it just touching those two strands that make up the X. We went under, now we're going to go over, and then we're going to go under like this. This is the same knot that we oftentimes tie on the heel of a whip. It's going to be the knot that we tie on the heel of this whip temporarily, uh, momentarily, I should say. We went under, now we're going to go over this one, under this one. Same deal. Don't pull tight, just touching that X. We're going to go over this one, and we're going to spread these apart and go under this one. No twists. I love it. I'm going to go over this one, and we're going to dig this one out and go under that one. We're going to go over this one, under this one. And we're going to go over this one and under this one. Now I'll just start the expansion pass and we'll take a break here. So now, as it currently stands, this is a single pass 7x6 Turk said knot. And again, we're going to take all the strands and just kind of push them around so that all of the squares in between them are uh, about the same size. Again, notice how loose everything is at this point. Everything is still quite loose. I can push everything around wherever I want it to be, and that's the idea. Okay, looking good. Push these down a little bit there. We can see that cone shape already taking place right there. You see that? Now I'm going to find a single point on this knot. I'll start with the first pass. I'm going to hold this with my index finger and thumb and just work my way around here, all the way around the knot. And what this is going to do is it's just going to snug things up just the slightest bit, working it all the way around like that. And just kind of feel for strands that are moving a little too much, that are too loose. Like, see this one here? It's a little on the loose side. I'm just going to pull it right there. And wherever you pull a strand, or a section of a strand, you're going to want to follow through all the way to the end. If you pull up a little, a little hump in a certain spot, it won't go away until you pull the slack all the way out towards the direction that you're tying the knot. So I'm going around, pulling that slack out very loosely. You'll get a feel for this the more you do it, as, as far as how tightly to pull. Uh, if you're doing one of these knots, particularly in Whipmaker's Cord, the lighter touch is king. There we go. Just pulling those little loops. 
and I'm pulling at about the uh, tension that I would use to pick up a praying mantis. Like that. And there's the end right there. And that looks good. I'm just going to shape it a tiny bit more before I begin the second pass of this 7x6 Turk set knot, making sure that none of those little squares are abnormally shaped. The idea is just having everything uniform, symmetrical, and the same shape. All right. So at this point, it's pretty easy. As of now, we don't have a ferrule to work around like we will when we do the other side. This is the easy part. The next part's a little more complicated. But as long as you keep in mind that three millimeter gap around the edges of the foundation, you will be fine. I guarantee it. So let us, exp um, let us do a second pass on the seven by six Turk said knot. Now it's a game of follow the leader. Everything this strand does, the initial pass, we're going to mimic it on the right side everything it does. It went under, we're going to go over. And then it went under there, so we'll do the same thing. And the only time that you do, you mimic a strand um, up to the right, down to the left, is if you're doing an expansion pass or tying a different type of knot. This is just a 7x6 simple Turk said knot. If I was doing um, a herringbone knot, things would be different, but we talk about that in a different video. So it goes over, we'll go over. Then it goes under, we'll go under. Everything the strand does, the lead strand, we do the same thing that it does, but we carry that action out on the right-hand side. Over, we're gonna go over. Under, we're gonna go under. Over, under. And I'm gonna get the twists out like I previously described. It goes over, we'll go over. Under, we're going to go under. It goes over these two, we'll go over these two. And then it goes under this one, we'll do the same. Going to Illinois tomorrow to hopefully Film tornadoes. Um, it is my single favorite activity to do in this world, is to photograph and film severe weather. I love it so much. And it's been three years since I've seen a tornado. Hopefully that'll change tomorrow. If you guys want to uh, follow along on the adventures, my second YouTube channel is in the upper right hand corner. You can check back up in a few days to see if I saw any tornadoes. I have some other videos on that channel that have to do with uh, nature, birds, insects, and just science overall. It's a place where I like to do experiments and just explore physics and science based things. Again, we're just following that lead strand. Everything it does, we're carrying that action out on the right hand side. Whoops. Let me settle this camera down. There we go. And I'm letting the natural expansion of the knot do the tightening. I'm not pulling any harder on this pass than I did on the first pass. Because we have so many places where strands go under, over, under, over, it tightens naturally by itself. We don't have to pull it, these crazy tensions, you know. It just kind of fills in itself. It's the beauty in these knots. When I was uh, younger, I used to just be so worried about pulling so tightly. But these are just things that you just learn over time. And hopefully I can maybe catch it at an earlier phase for you guys so you don't have to go through all the confusion that I did when I first started making whips. 
or at least tying Turk's head knots. Just letting the natural filling in do the tightening for us. And I haven't done anything crazy here. I'm just following that strand all the way through. As you can see, I've not been paying attention to my needle orientation, so <laughs> consequently I've had some knots form there, some twists, as it were. That's how we get them out, all the way to the needle. Keep that orientation like that. <clears throat> I can't tell you how glad I am that it's finally spring. Now you may see us starting to ever so slightly lose our cone shape to our knot, and that's okay because this is our friend all throughout the project of installing these knots we will be using this hammer we'll even be hitting this once the knot is completely tied and at no point do we really wail on the thing it's just to encourage the shape we would never hit this knot or the foundation at nearly the same velocity that we would if we were pounding in a nail or doing conventional blacksmith work. And we're coming up to the final pass that will make this knot a two pass seven by six Turks head knot. I had my microphone draped down. There we go. It's back in place. But you'll notice that things are getting nice and tight all throughout the knot. That's what we want. So here's the final pass. I got a bunch of twists in here. The tighter the knot gets, the more difficult it becomes to get these twists out on the fly, especially if you're having to push the twists underneath two strands that are already fairly tight. So try to keep those twists from happening at this point on in the knot. As you can see here, this is the final pass. Under two. Sometimes I'll just push those other two strands to the right with the needle just to add more room. And again, you can purchase Whitmaker's cord in the link in the description if you're in the United States and if you're overseas in Australia or Europe or wherever country you're watching this video from. I believe there's an international option to purchase the same material and I'll try to put a link in the description for that as well. And there we have it. Notice we have lost quite a bit of our cone shape, but that's not to worry. We'll be recovering that momentarily. I'm just going to take these two strands, what we started with and what we ended with, give them a little pull, another little pull, and just kind of turn the knot, make sure we don't have any obvious spaces, and we do not. So now I'm going to cut these. I'm not cutting them at the base yet until I kind of hammer this out and shape it a little more. So I'm going to leave an inch because the strands will sometimes recede into the knot. If we roll it, if we hammer it a little bit and shape it, um, it stretches things out, and even if we melt this into the knot itself, sometimes it'll break off and pull in. So I want to have some slack until I'm happy with the shape of the knot. Then we will cut those and melt them into the rest of the knot. So just pushing things around a little bit here. And that looks good. I reached into my tool bag and I grabbed this. This is a Craftsman uh, mallet hammer. This has a rubber end here and a plastic end, so it's a little bit softer than what we'd get with this. We'll be using this a little bit more, but right now I'm gonna take this and just uh, retrieve our, our uh, I'm just gonna use this here for this and we are going to retrieve our temporarily lost cone shape for this knot. So again, let's grab our hat. I'm going to double it up so it's a little softer on the bottom. And 
You can also do this on your leg. It's better to do it on your leg. But I want to have this in view for you guys. Again, hitting it at an angle just to get our cone shape back. You can see it's coming back. There we go. Okay, so this knot is shaped to my liking. We have a nice cone here. And I'm gonna take these strands, give them one last little pull. So we can see they have receded just the smallest bit. But now that this knot is the final shape that I want it to be, I'm gonna take my scissors and just snip them a couple of millimeters like this. Just fray it lightly with my finger and we'll give this a little melt. And push it into the knot. We'll do the same with this one. Leave a couple millimeters using the edge of that blue flame and push it into the knot assembly. Now this is the wonderful luxury we have of being able to tie this knot without the ferrule even being on the whip. Now once we slide it over and push it into place, we can get it so close to that knot. It's a luxury we won't have when we go ahead and tie the second knot into place here. We'll actually have to be working around the ferrule. As I mentioned, it's going to be a little more challenging but nothing that you guys cannot accomplish. It just takes a little practice. So this ferrule is right where we want it. It's not spinning, it's solid. At this point, we can go ahead and start building our second foundation for our second knot that sandwiches this ferrule in. So here I have another piece of my one half inch wide lead. So we're gonna do the same thing we did before. Wrap it around tightly Mark it with my fingernail right there and cut it. And we can go ahead and wrap it around so those two ends meet. And they do. We did pretty good there on that measurement, that cut. Now this point is a lot more important as far as making sure that the space between the foundation and the edge of the ferrule is exactly three millimeters because we won't be able to move this ferrule anymore. So this is gonna be our little guide. This caliper is a great little device. It is digital as well, but this thing runs through batteries so quickly I just use the, uh, the manual analog reference point that you can see there. And you can actually lock it too, which is very nice. This little screw here allows us to lock it so it doesn't slide when we go to take our measurements. That looks like three there. Very good. Do the same thing. I'm going to take a piece here and cut it off the spool and just get it started. Try to cover the general surface area of the foundation like that. That looks good. Spin it around. As you can see, we got a little bit of space over here, so we'll push it with our thumb. And now I'm going to take my secondary piece. Now, don't accidentally do this. We want the raised up ends of the knot to be touching the ferrule. This is something I would do. I'd you know, put this on tight in place, put my nails in. Oh, man, look what I have, an inverse cone. So make sure that it's on the right side, which is always going to be by the ferrule. Again, paying attention not to uh, overlap our joint there. We want it to be offset. But now we're just, we're just wrapping it for the sake of measuring how much we need so that those two edges just kiss. Okay, wrap that around. Little bit too much. We're just going to take off a sliver. And it's angled. It wants to be a perfect, perfect straight cut. And let's see. Another nice thing about having a bunch of excess lead is that sometimes you'll cut it a little too short and you'll get something like that. 
I don't think we did, but in case we did, we have plenty more lead to work with. And just pushing that over so it's flush all the way around. As you can see, it's a little lopsided. That's all right. Okay. It keeps wanting to creep over there a little bit. Things are going to be a lot more secure once we get our nails in, of course. All right. That looks good enough for now. I'm going to take my sinew and just do a couple of wraps on top of the quarter inch piece of lead now. A little tighter this time if we can. I don't know if I'm doing this exactly in the same order as I did with the first one as far as when the nails went in and when the wraps went in, but it's the general basic idea. So now let's get ready with those calipers. We want three millimeters. We are very close. We did close up just a little bit. So with my fingernails, I'm going to actually move the whole foundation assembly. Look at how we can still move that. See that? That sinew is just to hold those ends together so it's not doing this on us. It's still going to hold it straight. That's what we want. And we're not overheating on the camera, so that's good. There we go. We can see, we don't want to be able to see the first wrap, the half inch wrap. So we need to push things over a little bit there. And uh, in order to reach all the way down, what do we have? I'll use this little fid here to just kind of push everything. And then we can push this independently from the first wrap by holding it and then just pushing it like that. There we go. That looks closer to three millimeters to me. Yeah, that's much better. There we go. All the way around looks good. A little bit too much over there. Push that in just a touch. You really want to make sure you have everything where you want it because once those nails go in, we're not going to be able to move things around anymore. So this is a lot more critical than this one, as far as spacing goes. So take your time when you do this. I'm going to call that good. Let's take our nails and do the same thing that we did a few minutes ago. Holding the nail, I'm just this is doubling as a pliers right now. Plunging the nail straight in through the top, 12 o'clock position. And there we go, I felt the steel handle stop me, so we're gonna snip it now. I'm gonna turn it to the four o'clock position, grab another nail. Before I do that, I did just now notice a little bit of moving here. So there we go. There we go. And the reason I'm not using staples for this is because it's just staples aren't small enough to get in these little points, you know. For a heel knot, we will be using staples, but for this, I want to be more precise and these nails have a way of getting into tiny spaces because they're just tiny pointed cylinders after all. There we go. And snipping the head off the nail, protecting my eyes. Whew, man, that was a tough one. And now look at that, that's not going anywhere. Just gonna tap these in a little bit, being careful not to hit my ferrule. And we can begin the procedure of wrapping this and making a reduction to this step here. We don't want it to be a step, we want it to be a ramp. So let's do that now. First couple of passes are gonna be directly over the top here of the quarter inch piece. Nice and tight now. And now we're going to go right into that little grove there, that little 
crook, you know? And look at how this wonderful artificial sinew is like putty. Just molds to any shape you want with enough wraps. That looks good. All right, we're going to cut this. Now you may say, and you may wonder at this point, how in the world are we going to round this off here? Because we can't hit it with a hammer, it's too small. Well, the way I like to do it is take almost any tool that's hard. I may even take, uh, let's see, what should I use for this? Hmm, hmm. I'm actually going to take the end of these um, hemostats here and I'm just going to round it off like this. I'll zoom in for you guys so you can see what I'm doing. Ah, I have an overheating warning that uh, the camera is going to be shutting off by itself in a second. <laughs> so holding that ferrule back and just going over like this. And that's rounding that off nicely for us. So, yeah, and lead is so soft that I'm actually taking the edge like this and by simply pressing firmly, I'm rounding off those sharp 90 degree edges of our foundation. And this will just kind of help the edges of the knot flow a little more organically over the edges so there's not like a fine crease. And then we'll be, of course, dressing it up with a hammer anyway afterwards. So it's just a nice first step. We'll never be able to access this part of the whip ever again. So may as well get it as close as possible from the beginning, right? And that looks nice. Nice cone shape there. That's about to get even more cone shaped. And now we can work on this side, same way we did it before. Just flattening that edge, increasing the cone shape of our foundation. Again, I'm not wailing on it super hard, you know, just, just tapping it, molding that metal. There's the joint there. Just working on the joint a little bit. Okay, so I have laced in another five feet of black Whitmaker's cord, and it is time to tie our secondary Turk's head knot that sandwiches in this ferrule. So we're gonna do that in this way. We'll go ahead and start this knot right now. Same as we started the previous one, 45 degrees, holding that with my thumb around the back like this. And notice I do have to go over the whip itself so like this. And then we cross it like that over that strand, holding it again with my index finger. Around the back, we're going to go over this one here, under this one right here. I'm going to get the twists out of this. Okay. 
So we went under this one, and we're going to go over this one right there and hold that with my index finger. Around the back, like this. We're going to go under this one, like that. And we're going to go over both of these, over and over, and under this one, like that. And over that last one there, holding that with my index finger, and then around the back once again. We're just going to push this back into place where it needs to be laying, like that. And we're going to go over this one in the middle, right there, and under this one in the middle, like this. So we just went under this one here. We're going to go over this one and under this one here. Again, if we have some, some twists, in the strand. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of that momentarily. And see how everything is sliding this way? That's okay too. It's not a problem. We went under this one. We're going to go over this one here and under this one here. Like this. And see the whole thing's sliding off. That's all right. That's why we tie it loose to begin with. It's okay. And we'll go ahead and begin that expansion expansion pass by just tucking it underneath here, and then we'll pause and get things situated. And what I mean by situated partially is getting the twists out of the strand. Let's examine to see if we have any more twists, and we don't. Did a pretty good job about keeping that from happening. Notice all the slack here. This is the first pass there. We're gonna pull that. We're just gonna push everything upward into place and try to even out the knot. See, this is slipping. We're gonna push it right back into place, like that. And just try to kind of even things out. Again, making sure that all of those squares are roughly the same size, all those spaces in between the strands, like this. And I'm happy with that. And we can begin our expansion pass. Currently, as the knot stands, once again, this is a single pass 5x4, and now we're going to do the extension expansion pass to a 7x6. So we're going to follow the leader, whatever this strand does. We're going to do that on the right-hand side. It goes over, we're going to go over, it goes under, we're also going to go under. We rise to the top here. We have another X right there. We're going to go over both of these strands and pick this one up on the other side. So it went under, we're also going to go under too or under as well, not under two. Under as well. Like that. Again, not extremely worried about twists in the strand. I'm going to do my best to keep them from forming, but if they do, it's not the end of the world. Over, it goes over. Now we're following it to the left-hand side. It goes over, we'll go over. It goes under this one, we'll also go under this one. that. Here, once again, we will go over this strand and we'll spread these apart, dig this one out and go under that one underneath there. See that? Like that. There we go. We're going to go over this one. We're going to spread these two apart, and we'll find a strand underneath there that we need to go under. See that? There it is, over, under, like this. A 
little tricky part here, but nothing we can't handle. We're going to push this aside here like this. We're going to go over this strand and we're going to go under this one <clears throat> right here. Like this. A little twist was starting to form and I just jiggled the strand and got rid of it. We're going to go over this one, spread these, go under this one. There we are. Oh. Under this one here. Getting rid of the twist. And the expansion pass is almost over. We're going to take this strand here that's creeping up. We're going to push it back where it needs to be. We're going to go over this one, spread these two apart a little bit, dig that out, and go underneath that one right there. And we'll go ahead and tuck the strand in as if we're about ready to do the second pass, and then we'll take a break and get situated and assess our progress. There we have it. All right, setting this down, I'm now much more concerned about the spacing. At this point, I want all those bites to be starting to go in that little trough there, the spacing between the ferrule and the heel knot foundation, but not too far in so that there's no room for the second pass on this seven by six knot. Also, doing like I did the first time, I'm going to pick a certain location on the strand and pull the slack out of it. So we'll just do this, pull that, and follow it all the way around, just pulling the slack out. Right there. Right there. That feels pretty good. Just pushing these with my finger, I can still do anything I want to the knot. And as you can see from the beginning here, without even encouraging it with our little hammer, this knot already has a very pronounced cone shape to it. You see this? It's only going to get more pronounced as we go. Pull these here all the way around. Again, delicate touch. I'm not pulling these super tight. I'm just encouraging them to lose the slack. There we go. Started to get a little bit too tight there. That's okay. Just had to back off a little bit. We actually just made our way all the way around the knot, and that's what we wanted to do. And here it is, right there. Lastly, we're just going to make sure that everything is as symmetrical as possible, making sure all those little squares in between the strands are as even as possible. Again, examining in here, we notice that they are at the edge of the foundation, but there's still just enough room for our second pass. So the knot in its current state, this is a single pass 7x6, and again we're going to do a second pass to make it a two pass 7x6 Turk's head knot. So now everything that first pass did, we're going to do the same thing on the right hand side. Over, over, under, it goes under. We're mimicking it to the right the whole way through. There's an ugly twist there. I'm going to get the twists out all the way to the needle. Let's see if we can get this whole knot done before the camera overheats again, shall we? There we go. Now this is the part where I really want you guys to see and pay close attention to. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. I'm going to zoom in. So we're going over to the right, and then we're going under like this.
like that. And it might stop on the lip of this ferrule. And I'm just giving it a little pull so that it starts sliding into place. When we go roll this knot at the end and shape it with the hammer, all that stuff will be taken care of. Over, we're going to go over. Under, we're going to go under. Follow the leader. Everything it does, we do to the right. And I know that I repeat myself when I'm tying a knot, but I feel like it's helpful, you know? In the heat of the moment when you're tying a knot, a lot of things will look so similar, you know? And if you're not used to it, I tend to think that a constant reminder would be helpful. It would be for me. Maybe it's not for you. But that's why I repeat myself so much when I tie these knots for you guys. So it sticks. That's my intention anyway. So if it gets annoying, let me know in the comments and maybe I won't do it anymore. After all, you do have the video of it being tied in front of you, so I'd like to yeah, hear some feedback on that. Do you guys like it when I repeat the obvious through these videos as I tie knots, or is it annoying? Let me know. There we go. Over this one, under this one. And another thing I'd like to mention is even if we finish this knot <clears throat> and there's a tiny space in between the ferrule and the knot itself, when we roll it, that will be eliminated. So here we go. This is the strand we're mimicking. Everything it does, we're doing to the right. We're going over these two and then we're going to go under this one. It's a little bit hard to get to. You see that? A little bit hard to reach. That's okay. Because even if it overlaps the strand that we're mimicking like this, we just take our fingernail and just kind of push it into that crevice and it falls into place just fine. We're going over and I'm going under here. We're going under these two. And here you will want to make sure that there are no twists. So if you need to back up like I'm doing now, do so. Because it'd be very difficult to get these twists out on a second pass. So just take your time to make sure they don't form from this point, right, when, when it happens. See this? And you can guide the twists through and they'll be okay like this, see that? No problem. We're going to go over this one, under this one. Like that. Smash that in a little bit. Over, under these two. Just like our leader did. We're going to go over these two, under this one. Again, we have a twist, so we're guiding it through like this by forcing it through. And just pushing that, tucking it in there along the edge of the ferrule, over, under. going over these two, under these two. And then I want more room, so I'm just going to push it like this when the needle's halfway in. That gives me more room for the strand to pass through. We're going over these two, under this one here. Looks good. Over one, under one right there. Over two, under two. Following the leader. We're going over these two here and it's going to get a little tough here guys. 
might have to dig that out a little bit with the needle. See that? I'm not worried about getting it right next to it. Right now it's actually on top of it. That's okay. We'll go under that one, flip it, make sure there's no twists, and then simultaneously while I pull with this left hand, I'm tucking it in with my fingernail right there. Now see it's on top of it, so I can just push it to the side, maybe even take my needle and push that strand over a little bit, see? I'm gonna go over under these two. Just like that. Eliminate the twist. I'm gonna go over these two, under these two. Push it aside. We're gonna go over these two, under this one here, pushing it with the needle, making room. A little more room. Actually go, I'm gonna backtrack here and open it up from the other way. There we go. There we go. We're gonna go over this one here under these two here. I can feel the knot starting to tighten up. Over two, under two, like that. Over these two here, and this is gonna get consistently more difficult to access that entry point there. See that? And I'm gonna use that needle as a tool to just sort of dig that out. And there is the point right there. Eliminate the twist. Pull with the left hand while tucking with my fingernail, my thumbnail, into the edge. Pull to the side, under two, over two. And again, over two and under two. Pushing that to the side. Over two, under one. Pushing those strands with my needle. There's the entry point. And just to remind you guys, this is the same knot that we tied here. Same knot. The only difference is that it is tied from a different angle, different direction. Under two, over two, under two again. go over to and this is finishing up the last pass where we're going under these two strands and this will be the toughest one here right now the strand is on top of that other strand that's okay again pulling outward kind of towards the ferrule while tucking it in with my thumbnail picking it up on the other side following the leader it goes over to we're gonna go over to and then it goes directly after that Immediately after that, it goes under two. Push it to the side. And this is our last descending pass. Going under these two here. A little tough to open that up. There we go. The knot is getting naturally tighter now. And finally, we're going over these two Pushing to the side there. Under these two, and that'll be the final resting place of this strand. Like that. 
And again, let's grab our scissors, leaving an inch still. And now we're going to shape this knot. To encourage that cone shape, I'm just pounding this out a little bit. I go all the way around. Okay, I just rolled both of these knots, shaped this second one we just did, and now I'm going to take both strands, pull them, and now at this point we can go ahead and do what we previously did where we snip them, leave about a couple of millimeters, and give them a little melt, press it into the rest of the knot. And the final one there. Again, using the edge of the flame and push it into the rest of the knot foundation. The next step here is to just make sure with our lighter that all of the little strands are melted and are flush there on the end, as we can see they are. And I have here a one inch wide strip of lead. And this is going to make up our heel knot foundation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this right up here to where it's flush with the top, the edge there. And then I'm going to take a staple and drive the staple directly in, just like that. You can see that staple is completely flush. And now I'm going to begin to spin the lead around. And I want to make two revolutions exactly. So there's one revolution there, and I'm going to keep spinning, keep going around until the edge meets up with the beginning there. Again, I'm going to mark that with my fingernail here, and then I'm going to cut it like this with our scissors. As we can see, that matches up perfectly with the beginning there. I'm going to take another staple and drive that in as well. So we have right now two staples in there and I'm going to go all the way around the circumference of this just like that. Next I'm reaching for my little hammer again. I'm just going to start tapping the edge here to make this round. Now I'm going to tilt the whip up like this. Again, I'll have a little soft surface below it. And the same thing we did before, we're going to do to this. We have a nice view here. Notice how sharp that edge is there. I want to knock that down and round it off all the way around. So we're going to do so with our little hammer here. And this part's very satisfying to do. It's very fun. It's fun to observe that little piece rounding off. Again, I'm almost letting the hammer do the work here. Take a look at it. You'll notice that it's nice and smooth. There's a couple of little sharp points that we have to reduce. And this might start to peel up a little bit. That's perfectly okay. Let's go over it again with the hammer. Just like that. The next thing I'm going to do is take the hammer and just go over the tops of these staples to make sure they are also flush with the surface of the lead, like that. So then I'm just going to, again, just tap the top here to make sure that the lead is also flush with the end of our whip there, the heel. Next I have here a half inch wide 
piece of lead. And we're going to only wrap this around once. Again, we're going to avoid the seam. So I'm going to do it right here, all the way around. And we're just making one revolution there. So you can see that is where we want the two edges to meet. So I'll mark that with my fingernail and give that a snip. Right there. And I need to take off just a little bit more. That should do it. Tiny bit more. All right, as you can see, the two ends are meeting right there. That looks good. So again, we don't want any of this to happen. We want it to be completely flush with the top there, like that. Once we are completely flush with the top, reaching for my artificial sinew, and I'm just gonna do a few wraps here, temporarily. Like that. I can cut that artificial sinew. Again, just making one more time, making sure one more time that we're flush. That looks good. Let's reach for our stapler again. And we're gonna do a few more staples here. One there. And then right over on the other side of the seam. Turn it over, do one here. One there. We'll do one more right here. Put a soft surface below it again, and now I'm gonna tap these staples all the way in so that they're flush. And again, this might creep out just a little bit, just tap the edges. Reaching for my artificial sinew again. Now what I'm doing is going over everything, starting at the top, working my way down, pulling nice and tight. And now once I get to the edge of where the half inch stuff stops, half inch lead stops, I'm gonna fill in that step like you saw me do before. A little bit, and then I'm gonna go all the way down until about a millimeter from the bottom. If we go all the way down, it'll just slip down. So we're just gonna stop about right there. And then we're gonna come back up and we're gonna work on that step, causing it to be a ramp again, like this. And then keep flipping it over like this, because sometimes if you're not looking at the underside, you'll accumulate a lot of your sinew in one portion and it won't be symmetrical. That looks pretty good. If we want to, we can make a few more adjustments to this part right here, just to further the smoothing of that lip there. And this is going to cause the knot to look nice and round it off there where it touches the handle. Next, I'm tilting it on its end here, and I'm just gonna make sure that's completely round, just tapping the edges there. Again, this lead is so easy to work because it's so soft. And that looks good. At this point, I like to take some hockey tape here. Get that started. And I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom where it touches the handle. I'm gonna make one revolution here. And this is just to keep the artificial sinew from slipping around when we go to tie our knot. Just one revolution. This doesn't add any strength to the foundation at all. It's just to keep the artificial sinew behaving correctly. And then you can see there's a little bit more exposed at the top there. I'll just take one more piece, cut a little notch here, a little strip, and peel like that. And it follows that line, unlike Packing tape or electrical tape, this stuff holds that same width that you started with, and you can just tear it. 
because it's a mesh tape. Now I'm just filling in where we hadn't been before. There we go. This thing is ready to attach my little logo to the top there. You can put any logo you want on your whip, of course. I have a video all about installing these little aluminum discs on the end of a whip, so please refer to the video in the upper right hand corner. I will let this dry. Okay, so our little end piece here, the epoxy dried, and now I have my little emblem on the heel of the whip. And to spare you guys the time, I have a video all about how to tie this knot. It's a two pass seven by six heel knot that you see there. And also I have a video on how I attach my little uh, emblems there at the top of the whip. So to spare you guys some time, please check the videos in the description where you can learn how to tie that knot and how to install your own personal little emblem on the end here. The last thing we're gonna do on this whip, besides wax it and attach a cracker and have fun test cracking it uh, in a little bit, is we're going to add one little knot here, one Turk said knot. As I understand it, this is something that's unique to the whip in this film, in the film Zorro. And again, um, I have to stress, I'm not saying this is a Zorro whip. This is not a Nick's Whip Shop Zorro whip. I don't have the uh, copyright for that. So it is a, uh, a whip in the style of a Zorro whip. But let's go ahead and we're going to attach here one more Turk said not. And this is going to be about four inches down the thong of the whip. This is something that is uh, unique to the whips used in the film Zorro. I've never done it before, ever. I've never done it before. So I'm excited to do it. Instead of it being a seven by six, two pass Turk said not, it's going to be a two pass five by four, just to make it a little more slim. And we're not going to be using lead as a foundation here. Instead, I'm going to be using this artificial sinew. So it looks like if I reference off this picture, if I just kind of scale it up, uh, right about here where my index finger is, right? I want to get the proportions right. One, two, three, right about there. This is where we're going to put that last knot that is unique to these whips that were used in the Zorro film. And I'm going to do this with this artificial sinew, just wrapping very tightly here. And the idea is to build up the foundation with, uh, with the sinew alone to keep the profile down, to keep it more slim and narrow. And I don't want this to be bulky. A lot of the times uh, I'll see whips, very well-made whips. And at the transition, I'll see a giant transition knot that's the same size as the heel knot. And to each their own, that's fine. I just don't care for it. I like the whip to kind of get as far as knots go, I always like the largest knot on a whip to be the heel knot. I think it just makes the whip look better. It doesn't change the functionality of the whip at all. But I just, I like the way that it looks. If the knots going down the whip are smaller than the heel knot. Just personal preference, guys. I'm weird like that, I guess. So... And when we wax the whip, this artificial sinew is gonna tighten up quite a bit. And so will the knot that we tie on top of it. We're gonna be tying it again in whip maker's cord. So that looks good. I'm gonna snip that. And then I'm just going to round off this just a little bit here. 
I want the foundation to be smooth. I just, I just dipped the end of the whip in epoxy and thankfully it had already hardened. That would have been an embarrassing mistake to have to retie that knot just because I got wet epoxy on it. Let's get this out of the way. <clears throat> anyway, just shaping this foundation. And this is what I'll oftentimes do now on my normal bull whips that don't have a transition ferrule. I'll use just artificial sinew for the reasons I previously mentioned. It just keeps things streamlined, compact, and low profile. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now, we're getting a bit of a mess here accumulating on the workbench, aren't we? It always happens, guys. Every time I make a whip, is a big mess. I try to clean everything thoroughly after every whip, so I'm not getting a mess from multiple whips, because that takes a while to clean. So we have here three feet of whip maker's cord, again in black. Thread it into my type one lacing needle. And let's make some room. And let's go ahead and tie this knot. We already did this knot twice, basically, except this will be a five by four. We will not be expanding this to seven by six. 45 degree angle like this. Round the back like that. We're gonna go over, hold it with our index finger. And around the back here. We're gonna go over that one there, under this one here. We went under that one, get the twist out. Went under, we're gonna go over that one, hold it with the index finger around the back, under this one. Over that one, over that one, under this one. Under this one, and then over that last one, hold it with the index finger, around the back. When I go around the back, I'm not caring where the strand is. As long as I'm working the front accurately, everything in the back will fall into place. Over this one, under this one, like that. Over that one, under this one, over that one, and under that next one, like that. I like to do multiple ones at once just to make it quicker. And I'll stop right here. Get the first, or get the second pass started here. And now we can get our twists out. There's only one there I think we have to worry about. So just grab it, untwist it, and work it all the way around like that. Like this, get that out of the way. And there it is, good. The twist wasn't too far back, so we didn't have to go all the way around, did we? That's nice. All right, and now let's just pull the slack out of the strands like we've done so many times before. Pull out the slack, pull out the slack. There we go. Now look at how big these spaces are over here and how much closer they are together over here. I'm gonna pick the center point of the focus of the cluster and just push everything away from that epicenter, if you will, you know? push the strands around. When we, when we do this, we'll distribute the slack uh, unevenly again, so we might have to go through and pull individual portions of the strand around. So that looks pretty good. A little bit too spaced out there. All right, 
Now let's go ahead and finish the second pass. Follow the leader. Whatever this strand does, we do to the right the whole time. And this will be obviously a lot quicker than a 7x6 because less passes are needed to fill it in. Oh, look what I just did. I went the wrong way. I meant to go this way. Get the twists out. Whitmaker's cord is a little twistier because it's a thinner and smaller diameter than normal 550 parachute cord. But it's so worth it in the end though. The little extra work is so worth it. Um, a lot of the times nowadays when I get an order for a normal whip, normal meaning just one transition knot, if the colors available allow, I like to do the first pass with 550 cord and then I'll do a secondary pass with either Whitmaker's cord or type 95 parachute cord, which is even thinner than Whitmaker's cord. Again, for the previously stated reasons of um, keeping that knot as small as possible. I don't like a bulky transition knot particularly, personally. All right, here we go, rounding the corner. This is always the fun part, guys. This is the satisfying part, I should say. It's always so nice to have worked hard on a whip and seeing that last knot forming in front of your eyes, knowing that you only have a few passes left on it before it's done, before the whole whip is done, especially some of those 12 footers. Whew, man, 24 plat eight footer, something like that. You finish that knot, it's a good feeling. It's interesting though how much time the paperwork can sometimes take and the shipping. By paperwork I mean printing a packing slip and filling out the certificate for the whip, stamping the certificate, signing it, filling in all these spec specifications for the particular whip that I've just finished. That eats up a lot of time. More than I ever thought it would. But presentation is important to me with my company. I really like the presentation. I think it's an important element in a business, you know. And here we go. This is it. Ah, nice. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm just going to take my two thumbs and push those bites together a little bit. I'll snip this at an inch and then I'll ro hand roll this. I might actually take this little slab of marble, which is a sample for a countertop that the company let me keep. It's kind of nice. I, I use it to roll little small parts of a whip that I can really get in there and focus on. I obviously wouldn't roll a whole whip with this because there's not a lot of surface area, but for little knots like this, if you just need to kind of round off a corner or whatever. Look at that. Just slides right in there and does great. It does wonders. So just a little roll on the whole thing. And then just encouraging that dome shape of the uh, knot itself. Push it in a little bit. There we are. Give these two strands a pull. One two, and a snip and a melt. This always locks by itself, this lighter. Press it in, and the same with this one here. And that'll tighten up even more when we wax the whip. All right. 
Now for some of you uh, extra observant viewers on this video who pay special attention to detail, you may notice something here. You may say, you may look at this front knot and say that looks a lot smaller than what you worked on in the video. Is that a different knot? Yeah, it is. I tell you what happened, uh, I didn't quite smash down the lead enough with the hammer and as a result this knot here was a little larger than this knot and it just did not sit well with me. I wasn't having it so I took a razor blade and cut the strands, pulled the lead out, put some new lead in there because it was kind of deformed from the nails and I made sure I smashed it down nice and heavily and uh, now the two knots are symmetrical in the same size. So this is a different knot than you saw me make. And that was my mistake, that was my bad. I didn't quite smash it down enough with the hammer and it was too bulky. Um, so yeah, to answer any uh, questions that may arise in the comments as to whether or not uh, that's the same knot, it isn't, this is a new one. But I did it all the same way. So if you follow this video, do what I did, but uh, take a little extra time to uh, pound down the edges of the lead before you go and tie that knot. Just a little uh, word of advice there for you. So, there we go. I really uh, appreciate your business, Alejandro. Your sister is an excellent silversmith, and Jack is an excellent metal engraver. And uh, it was really fun to make this whip. Had a good time making it. I always enjoy when someone sends me a custom piece, whether that be an end for a whip that they want on the heel, a beautiful transition ferrule such as this. And I really enjoy when someone has an elaborate custom idea that they want to see done. It's like, sometimes it's a challenge. Like the more elaborate that the whip is and their vision is, the more, the more of a challenge it is to me. And I, it makes me all the more like, I don't know the word for this, more determined to get it just the way you want it as a client who's ordering a custom piece of work. So let's heat up the wax, wax this bad bird, and we'll be uh, attaching the cracker and having some fun with this whip, testing it out. Also, if you guys are interested in making one of these micro whips, 12 plat, made with whip maker's cord, I have a video coming up in the next few weeks on how I made this whip. And you can make one just like it. It's a very fun build and an easy build. It has one belly, and the 12 plat overlay. So video on this little guy coming up very soon. Well, thank you guys so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please do reach down, hit the like button or hit the dislike button if you didn't like the video. The problem with that is I won't know if you dislike the video because YouTube got rid of the dislike button. So hit the dislike button and leave a comment as to why you didn't like the video because that'll help me kind of figure out what you guys like and what you don't. This whip is waxed. I have a black cracker attached to the end, and it's time to give it a few test cracks. And after all, what would a target whip be without hitting some targets? I have my trusty worn out target stand here. And we're gonna use some pretzels. These have been sitting in my trunk for about two years. Awful. Ugh. Excuse me, shouldn't have done that. Ah, can I finish the job? Close enough. <laughs> we'll hit the vertical target too, shall we? Yes.
we'll do a couple more here before we call it a day. And there we have it guys, a six foot whip in the style of Zorro. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one.